Hey everybody, my name is Ronald. I'm the co-founder of About Fraud and I'm the host of the webinar today. As usual, as About Fraud, we have one housekeeping rule. Please be active. Please ask questions. So on the right-hand side of your panel, you can see a chat box and we can already see some of you have found the chat box. That's the place where you can ask your questions. We're trying to incorporate your questions straight away into our discussion. If we can't, we have enough time at the end to address your questions. Before we jumping into the details, today we have actually one poll, which I would like to start now. We would like to understand from the audience, what is the biggest challenge which you're going to face next year? So you can see five answers. I hope the poll works. Please give your feedback and then we're coming back to this later to see what is the main challenge for the audience next year. Perfect. Then let's kick this off. Today we have an interesting topic talking about synthetic fraud. And there are a lot of details which we have prepared, a lot of insights. And that's why I'm more than happy to introduce the two speakers of today. So we have Bri and we have Mike. Bri, ladies first, please do a short intro, who you are, what is your role? And yeah, welcome. Thank you. My name is Bree Reimer. I'm a senior fraud investigator for SoCure. I've been doing this for about four years now. Perfect. Welcome, Bree. Mike, your turn. Hey, thank you, Ronald. Thank you. Very nice to be here. I've been a fan of About Fraud since I think you were had maybe four, four participants. So glad to be on a webinar with you. So I'm Mike Cook. I'm at SoCure now. I've been here for about an hour, an hour, a year and a half. I have fraud product, fraud solution responsibilities. I've been in the industry now for over 35 years, working for big companies like Experian and American Express, and also have started a couple of companies. ID Analytics is probably the best well known, and then XOR Data Exchange. And my whole life has been focused on building uh, fraud solutions to help stop fraud in account takeover, new account fraud across every industry from crypto to, to auto to credit card to retail banks, subprime, you name it. And uh, very excited to be here today with Bree. I do get to run fraud investigations at Secure, which is a side job for me, but it is probably my favorite job at Secure. Just, I get to work with a great team and get to really be down into the data. So I love it. Thanks, Mike, for being here today. As the audience can see, we are packed with a lot of experience, a lot of insights, which you want to share today. And also the audience can see on the right hand side, we have a kind of agenda. We have a lot of things where we want to provide insights in this uh, one hour session today. But again, if you have questions, please use the box and hopefully we can provide even more insights. But in order to kick this off, I think it's good to talk about what is actually synthetic identity and what's the fraud behind and how this is originates. I think that's a good point to get started, Mike, to really set the stage to get a common understanding about what we're actually talking about today. Sure. So synthetic fraud, I think most people know about what synthetic fraud is at this point. If you don't, it's something very, it's something very good to get educated on. So synthetic fraud is used a combination of personally identifiable and identifiable information to fabricate a person or entity. It's important to think about synthetic fraud as also is as well to commit a dishonest act for personal or financial gain. So that's the Fed definition. And we'll talk about that on the next slide. The simplest thing to think about when you think about synthetic fraud, right? Because a lot of times you'll say, hey, what's the difference between synthetic fraud and third-party fraud? Third-party fraud is where I've stolen an identity and I want to use that identity to perpetrate some kind of fraud. In third-party fraud, the name, the date of birth, and the social are always going to be accurate and they're accurately going to tie back to a real person, right? That is the ticket to the game if you want to perpetrate third-party fraud because you need those three identity elements to be the same. The address might change, the email, the phone, IP, of course, device, but you always want to get the name and address and social right if you're a fraudster trying to perpetrate synthetic or third-party fraud. Synthetic fraud is very different. It is basically a made-up identity. And we'll talk about there's different kinds of made-up identities. But what you'll find is that the fraudster name and the date of birth and the social never make sense. If they do make sense, right, and you're doing fraud investigations and you that I can validate that's Bree's social, that's Bree's date of birth, and that's Bree's name, then it's going to be third-party, first-party fraud, money muling, or something along the lines of that. For synthetic fraud, 
the social is always going to be the wrong social. It'll either be a little bit more than fat fingered, hopefully, or it'll be a completely fake uh, social that's not attached to that identity. Generally, it'll be a random social that was delivered, that was created after September or after 2011, or it'll be just a tumbled social. And it just depends on the kind of fraud that is, is getting perpetrated. If you go to the next slide, or I guess I can do that. Hold on. I know I can do that. Yeah. So if you go to the next slide, this is the Fed definition. So synthetic fraud has been around for a long time, gosh, 20 years. And we never really had a good definition for synthetic fraud which I don't think helped with solving for the problem, right? Because solving for the problem oftentimes takes good label to build machine learned models against or good definitions that you have in your fraud investigation team so that they can label those things properly right? and identify a synthetic from something else. And so the Fed got together. I was honored enough to participate in this probably about a three month effort to define synthetic fraud a little bit more deeply. And so I'll go through these quickly because it's really important. You're going to hear the word fabricated and manipulated a hundred times in this hour. And it's extremely important to understand the difference between a fabricated and a manipulated synthetic identity. And first I'll cover those two terms and then I'll cover the ones that are below it. But a fabricated synthetic is completely fictitious. So what I mean by that is the PA elements may be real. It may be a deliverable address. Of course, it's a date of birth that actually exists, right? It's a social security number that should pass checks that, that are social security numbers that are real, that are either from a range that's been provided or a random range. But fabricated identities are completely fake, and you will not find any consumer that ties back to those. Fabricated identities are built, and let's, we'll go ahead and follow this through. They're built to be very nefarious. There is no good reason that a fabricated identity is built. And that's either going to be a payment default scheme, like a P2P scam that we see quite often where fabricated guys are uh, the new money mules. And so we'll see them in payment default schemes. We'll also see them in other criminal activity, especially in depository accounts like DBA savings or investments. And that's where... They are acting as a money mule, oftentimes P2P. Sometimes they're doing money laundering. They can be doing human or drug trafficking or even terroristic activities. Department of Homeland Security is really concerned about that. So fabricated identities um, are very different than a manipulated synthetic. So that's fabricated. Let's talk about manipulated now. Manipulated is the actual consumer. So when you think about fabricated, it's a real organized fraudster. That's what they do for a living. Manipulated is generally a consumer, and they may not be that sophisticated. Do this in your spare time. Type in to a Google search, right? How can I increase my credit score quickly? And you basically get a recipe for how can you manipulate your identity in a way that you can establish a brand new credit report um, on at the bureaus by applying for credit several times at some point after you've applied for credit, even if you're turned down, it doesn't matter. You still get a credit header created in your name that then inquiries start to get underneath it. It looks like a thin file. You can establish a thicker file by doing things like piggybacking. You go to certain places where they'll give you a trade line that isn't a true trade line, but as long as you're paying for it, they don't care. Manipulated identities are the consumer trying to avoid a past bad experience. Just fabricated where the Fed developed two underlying subtypes. Manipulated has two underlying subtypes. One is credit repair. And when you think about credit repair, these are the bad manipulated. They're both fraud, right? But these are the bad manipulated uh, synthetics where you're going to take a loss. It's going to be a card environment. We see it often in subprime auto and auto finance. We'll see it in other kinds of environments. But this is basically where, hey, I went bad before. Uh, I learned that I can do this and not get caught. I'm going to establish another credit report. I'm going to get credit cards. I might get an auto. Never gonna, I have no intention to pay people back. And so that's credit repair. Fraud for a living is a little bit different. Fraud for a living is, hey, I went bad in the past. I realize, I recognize, right? I have the maturity to realize that I need a good credit score to survive. I need a car. Um, I need a credit card. I need something to be able to live. And so that's fraud for a living. These are generally people that have seen bad economic downturns. We saw a lot of these people in COVID. We saw a lot of these people that got impacted by COVID in the economic downturn. We'll probably see more and more of these people if the uh, economy continues to, to go down a little bit. We also see these in undocumented workers. Fraud for a living are people that will pay you back. They tend to be more risky. 
but they generally will not end up in a charge off environment. They'll end up in a slow pay environment. And it's important to understand manipulated versus fabricated for a couple of reasons. Their behaviors are different. And then probably the most important is when you step up to do authentication, because, hey, this is scored high or this looks risky, you need to know that when you validate a manipulated identity, you don't want to do it off a driver's license that doesn't have a social. You want to validate something from that person that is a legit document with their social because they should not be able to provide you one that has the real social. For fabricated, these guys will create driver's license, a good document validation solution. So Cure has a document solution that basically looks at driver's license and detects fakes that have been created. But so fabricated, step up, do a document validation if you want to. Manipulated, don't validate with a driver's license, validate with something with the social. Thanks, Mike. I think that's a good foundation for our discussion of today. I think that you mentioned synthetic identities are nothing new, but we're still talking about this topic. So that's maybe two, two questions to this. One is, why do you think, based on your experience, we're still talking about this? Why is it difficult to detect it? And maybe the other question, you have been a long time in the industry. Do you see any kind of changes or trends for synthetic identities? Is there any kind of, let's say, evolution? So there is a huge evolution in synthetic identity right now. It's happening under our feet. So I'm going to push that answer off a little bit, but let me respond, Ronald, to the question about why is it difficult to detect it? This is some, a study that we did at Secure just to show we, we get who contribute feedback data to us. How did these people perform if they were originated? Are they good customers? Did they go turn into new application fraud? Were they third party? Were they synthetic? Is it first party fraud? Do we see account takeover happening? So we get that data reported to us. Some of our customers, a good chunk of them, have recently started reporting synthetic labels to us, right? And if you look up here, you can see these circles. In the middle of the circle, it says, let's take the bottom right one from the bank industry. In the middle of the circle, it says, this is what they told us this is. It's synthetic. And then Brie and team will go through these from time to time and they'll look at them and they'll say, hey, for bank A that provided us this synthetic population, again, we're down on this bottom right uh, hand corner circle. When we actually do the fraud investigation, we find that a big chunk of it is first party fraud. More than half is third party fraud. And there was only a few synthetics in there, right? And we've seen this in fintech, gig economy, NPL, gaming. Nobody labels synthetic, so don't worry about that. <laughs> Let's keep trying to label it. We'll get better at labeling it. But when you cannot label synthetic, you can't define it too well. And so not being able to define, not being able to label it too well is an impact and makes it difficult to create clean machine learning models that will identify those things. The other reason is the bureaus, even though they're part of the solution, they're part of the problem too. And that is where a synthetic fraud grows, right? At the bureau. So they can establish a synthetic fraud account. You can manipulate your own credit. Report. And again, you can go online and you can see that. You can fabricate a report, make a complete fake one, and you could eventually get that established at the bureaus. Then it has a header. You have inquiries. You can eventually get this data. A lot of people use the bureaus as the authoritative source. You have to have a good understanding of synthetics. You have to have a definition. You have to label it. You have to realize that there are synthetics hiding in the system that you are using for credit risk. And especially in regulated businesses, they need to understand that CIP offerings, consumer identification programs, where you're supposed to know, is this a real person that's coming to me? They generally use the bureaus to do authentication. So you cannot rely on a CIP program to stop synthetics. So it, it's difficult to detect because I don't think that a lot of people understand synthetic fraud. And if you don't understand it, there's a lot of things that are against you when you're trying to do it. And we'll talk about the patterns here in a bit. They're pretty fascinating. I have a little question uh, but before we jump into the details, because in the next step, you're going about the human factor. But I have a question, Mike, do you have any statistics how many of the labels are automatically labeled and how many are labeled by the bank, let's say, manually? Yeah, that is a great question. And that is the problem. 
<laughs> so I'll tell you this. So I think that probably if I had to say 95% are systematically labeled. And when you systematically label synthetic frauds, think about it, right? You guys on the call, how do you, how would you do that? You're like, okay, they go bad. If I'm a card, if I have a card portfolio, they've run up their account to 85% utilization the first three months. They've never made a payment. I can't get a hold of them. They charge off, they're synthetic. So the issue here is oftentimes we look at financial performance or we look at behavior or we look at financial performance and behavior to identify a synthetic. Generally, what that means is we're only looking at the bad accounts to identify synthetic. So we're using not a great rules engine to try and find them. And then we also are only looking at the good accounts, right? A lot of synthetics, especially in DDA, and you guys are going to see this here in a bit, one to three percent of your open active accounts, if you have depository accounts, investment, savings, VA, if you have those accounts and you're on watching this webinar, one to three percent of those accounts, open active accounts are synthetic or more if you don't have anything at the front door trying to catch them. So labeling needs a lot of work. We've really built clustering algorithms. We've built some other technologies to try and weed out these synthetics from every industry, not just in the bads, but also in the goods, but fraud investigations and fraud investigators like Bree are the single best source to identify synthetics. I think that was a good bridge, let's say to the next point. We talked about labeling automatically, but again, the human touch is very important, especially for this topic, but that's a really good question to Bri that you can provide a bit more details to the audience, how Secure is actually, uh, let's say, leveraging the human in the loop of the analyzing the data and really providing a better output. Free. Thank you. So Curious Fraud Investigators, myself included, are manually reviewing identities from ongoing sales, fraud attacks, and other identities that we analyze from Secure's customers using multiple data sources to determine what kind of type of identity this is, such as fabricated, manipulated, or a non-synthetic identity. So back to those previous slides, you saw that we were also reviewing third-party identities, true identities, and things like that. These data sources allow us to review all known social security numbers, date of birth, names, addresses that have ever been seen with these identities, how long this person has been around, we can even see things like social media accounts linked to their email and phone numbers. And having a manual fraud investigations team whose main expertise is in identity fraud is crucial to creating clean labels and accurately telling the difference between risk and non-risky behaviors, especially when it comes to things like typo or date of birth, right? When it appears to be more of an attempt at fraud rather than a simple misdeed. When did this person tie to this information and when did they not? All of these things take a very careful eye and oftentimes context about each identity situation to get right. So for instance, we've seen multiple cases where identities get labeled as a fabricated identity or a synthetic identity, like we saw in the previous slide. But by using a couple different pieces of information, we can tell that this person's probably just new to country. And we could use things like social media aspects, right? Because your fabricated identities are much less likely to have 10 years of social media history that we can go look at. Whereas we've also seen identities being marked as good, where we can actually tell looking through their social security number information, their date of birth information, multiple files that we've been able to find with similar information that this person has manipulated their data multiple times in the past. From there, we document all the findings that we have and trends throughout multiple different industries. And we provide that information to our analytics team so that way they can determine what indicators are the most helpful for machine learning. So as fraud investigators, we look at thousands of identities and we can pass along that human insight to the analytics team. You may have these rules that get triggered off, but providing context for what those rules mean, what which ones are the best we can provide, and the analytics team can create new signals from those insights and their machine learning algorithms can look at hundreds of thousands of millions of data points to enhance the models after that. Thank you, Pri, for this insights. I think also I've seen recently a white paper which Secure thing published 
Maybe Mike, you can provide some insights. What are the key findings you can share today? That's a good point for the audience. And also we have the white paper actually as a handout, which I will share afterwards as well, that if someone's interested going to all the details, which are actually in the white paper available. Mike, yep. maybe you can provide some insights here. I will. And before that, I'm going to respond to Bree's work because the work that the fraud investigation team is, it goes even beyond that, right? Because one of the things that we try and do at Secure, and I'd imagine other people try and do it too, is we have different models, different models that detect third party, different models that detect synthetic. We're building a first party fraud model, right? Those behaviors are all different. But what you'll find is that machine learned models sometimes have difficulty separating those things out. So you may have on the same application, a high scoring synthetic and a high scoring identity fraud, third party fraud, right? And these two things shouldn't happen because it's either synthetic or it's third party fraud. And for me, I've always called that the shoulder shrug. I don't know. We think it's fraud. <laughs> you figure it out. And so our focus has been to even go back into the models once they're built and look at that overlap and have the fraud investigation team tease out the characteristics that the machine learning model is not picking so that we can continue to move those Venn diagrams further and further apart such that at some point, these things are two separate types of fraud and we're identifying them because it is important again on treatment. If I give you something and say it's maybe synthetic, maybe third party, your investigation is a little bit different. If I give you something and say it's third party or it's synthetic, then your fraud investigation or your automated validation is going to be different. Something I wanted to mention there. So on the study, yeah, we just did a study. We released it, I think, gosh, last week. And it's one of those research papers that I'm really proud of. I'm proud of the analytics guys. This was a real team effort between analytics and fraud investigations, right? To where we wanted to understand, hey, what is going on with synthetic patterns? How do you build a synthetic identity? Because you have to sit, when you think about a synthetic identity, you have to sit down and build it. So you can make it any name. You can say, hey, I'm going to build a hundred females and I'm going to see how the females work, or I'm going to use male names or whatever. So you can really build it any way you want it. So we want to understand how are people building identities? And then also what's been the behavioral changes in synthetic, especially following COVID, because we started feeling the ground shifting underneath our feet. As we're looking at the data, we're like, hey, something's going on here. The first analysis we did against very clean synthetic broad labels since thousands. And we looked to see, hey, what's the name that's most often used? What's the date of birth? What are the phone? What's the Gmail? What's the email account? You can see all those things here. And what we found is that Michael Smith is number one synthetic broad name that's used. And you'll see on the next slide, it's interesting. There's two schools of thought in synthetic fraud when you're developing them, if you're a bad actor. One is I'm going to create an identity that looks very much a real person. I'm going to pull names out of the top 100A list of most popular names. I'm going to look at the most popular surnames and I'm going to use those. And so there's that action. And we were surprised to find that is the prevalent case with synthetic identities when you're building them. The second is, hey, I want to build young people identities. I want to build the, I want to look synthetic that or look like they're from out of the country and they've just come and they have a thin file, right? So that I make it look like I have a thin file. Interestingly enough, that showed up less in the analysis. And what we saw more is people using these names that were, and you can see here, Michael Smith, it's number four on the SSA. Smith is the number one name on the census thing, right? James Williams, James, number one in the SSA, number three in the census. So you can see these records and which ones are used most. But it's interesting that these names are very popular names. And so they're trying to hide within the just the normal American data set. So it's really interesting that we saw that. The other thing we wanted to look at, so the names are interesting, right? But for us, probably the even more interesting thing was we looked at attack rates. And so what an attack rate means is, how often is an industry, and in this example, BA, how often are they being attacked by synthetic? So this doesn't mean the account was open. It just means, hey, our customers received an application in a synthetic, and it was either manipulated or fabricated. We want to understand the patterns, manipulated and fabricated pre-COVID, during COVID, after COVID, and then even as, a, as a close up to September 2022, 20, so most recently. And so the really important thing from this data is that we found synthetic fraudsters have changed their behaviors. So if you've been doing this long enough, you know that in the beginning, 
synthetic fraud was attacking credit cards and attacking telcos. Credit cards is an easy one. They wanted to basically run up the limit, take what they could. Back in the back 10 years, 20 years ago, when this was identified, um, telephones were financed. And so rather than have to buy it or finance it separately, you were actually given it for free if you were to sign a two-year deal, for instance, with the carrier. So what these guys would do is they would steal a phone. And then they realized, oh, if I set up as a business, I can steal up steal more than one phone. I can get 24 phones maybe at one given time. Back then it was fast cash. Then about 10 years later, it moved to bust out where synthetic fraudsters got smarter. They figured, hey man, I can bust out over the limit if I do this properly. And so that's been the patterns for years. However, what we're seeing, if you look at this chart from 2020, you can see for VA attacks, bad actors are fabricating identities following the pandemic and those things are continuing today. You can see the red line, it's increasing. Manipulated isn't going up much, right? So what this tells you is, if you think about it, everybody sit at home doing, doing the webinars, you know, what's one of the biggest issues that we're facing today as a country from fraud? And so for scams, you need a place to move that money. So if I do unemployment scams against the U.S., the government, if I do P2P, I need that money to go into a money mule account. Now, in the past, I'd be happy to get money mules and pay them, but I have to basically manage that organization. I have to pay people. What we think synthetic fraudsters have determined is that they can build money mules synthetically within DDA accounts or any depository account. And we'll talk about that in a bit, such that then they can use those for fraudulent money movement. And you can see here, these spikes in 22 kind of came along. They go along with the COVID increase. And then the following spikes in 2021, 2022, are spikes we think for either unemployment, we think for a P, or we think even tax frauds. Right now, we're seeing this huge behavioral shift, right? So if you are listening on this webinar, if you have deposit accounts, okay, investment, we'll talk about that here in a bit, savings, and you don't have anything up front trying to catch synthetic at the front door other than CIP, then you have at least one to 3%, probably more, synthetics operating in your accounts. And that's a big, gonna be a big impact, especially if the CFPB comes back, like they're saying they're gonna do and push those losses from consumers back onto the bank or the FinTech. So what wasn't a financial loss in the past will be one in the future. Similar things here, so it's investment. It's a little bit interesting. These are investment accounts and they are, they didn't really attack in 2020. It was mostly the DDAs. But it looks like in 2021 and 2022, they started realizing these are depository accounts. I can still use these to move money too. So we've seen across our customers, a huge increase later in 2021, 2022 for fabricated identities, which again, remember fabricated the worst kind, right? Because those, there's no good reason. There is no credit for a living reason to do it. You really are either doing payment schemes or you're doing money laundering, you're doing human and drug trafficking, other kinds of nefarious, really honestly terrible things, right? So again, if you have an investment account, you're not safe from synthetics, right? So if you wanted to, this is a QR code. This was a teensy tablespoon bite of the data that is available in this report. If you get a chance, get one later too, but take a picture of this thing. Download the synthetic report. If you have questions, get back to, to me or to Bree and we can respond to them. But we do think that uh, we believe we can eradicate synthetic fraud by 2026. There's a lot of effort that we need from the industry and government. But this is the first part, we believe, of educating the industries, educating the government on, hey, here's the changes in synthetic fraud patterns. And we should all be aware of these things. Thanks, Mike. I have one question from the audience, which I think is interesting. Is it actually possible that both fraud types can overlap? I have an answer, Bree. Do you want to answer that one? Can the can manipulated and fabricated overlap? I would say no, because the definition of a fabricated identity is complete fabrication, right? There is no close ties to any known identity versus a manipulation will be considered a manipulation because it closely resembles a true identity. Yeah, and I would agree with Bruce. And so when you're manually reviewing, then you should absolutely be able to set each of those in two different piles. Um, our models, I will tell you this, we might say it's, man, it's manipulated 
and it's fabricated because again, it is a machine learned model. And instead of looking at one at a time, you're looking at millions, right? So that's another example of how Bree and the team are really going to help to continually constantly shift that out. So why, what is the situation where maybe you get manipulated wrong, it should be fabricated, you get fabricated, manipulated, you have both. We really can now pour through those things and figure out, okay, as a fraud investigation teams, what are we seeing? What are the variables? What are the signals that we think that the analytics guys can pull from? We feed them that data, the model constantly gets better and better. There was another really good question, if you don't mind from Joanne, what if the customer does not give a social? If they don't give a social and you're trying to solve for synthetic fraud, you're going to have a hard time. You need the social to solve for that. Yes, you could write a model. It'll rank order, uh, but it will not be as accurate as it should be. You'll have a lot of false positive rates. So if you're not asking for the social, it makes sense to ask for it. You can pre-fill the social. I know that some sponsor banks look down on that. If you do pre-fill the social, then it depends on where you pre-fill it from. If you're pre-filling it from bureau data, you're basically going to take a social from a synthetic and apply it to your synthetic. If you have a score, it should catch that, right? If you are bringing in the social from the bureau again, you might accidentally pull in the real social if you're pre-filling, which may not be a bad thing because then you're getting the real credit report. The synthetic score would be low, but you would lose the intent of the customer, the consumer, to know if they were trying to perform synthetic fraud and manipulated or not. Fabricated is going to be hard to solve for. Thanks, Mike, for these details. Thanks, Pri, for this kind of definition. Or again, sharpening the definitions. There's no overlap. It's really like one or the other. And you also have some fun stuff now prepared. I think we talked about a lot of definitions, but I guess in the in practical terms, it's not always easy. So that's why we have prepared now a few cases where the audience actually will get a poll in a second to really decide, is this like a real identity or fake identity? And Pri, please give us the intro to this kind of identity and then I will kick off the poll. All right. So. This is the application information, if you will, and a little bit of credit information for this identity. So you have your name of Amy K. Martin, this phone number, the data that we're pulling out for you is it is a voice over IP phone number. Their residence is that they own a residence. However, if we look at their trade lines, you can see that they don't have a mortgage listed on that. It says they make $100,000 a year. Their credit score is pretty high at 742. We have a PO box address here. The email address that they're using matches their name. It says that they're self-employed. However, the income is not substantiated by credit file. And we also have the information that this is a random social security number. Feel free to also look down at those last four lines that tell you their trade line information. And then we can go from there. Ronald, how do they respond to this? Uh, Oh, good. No, I, I just kept everybody a moment to really go through. So the poll is open. So please take your chance and really identify if this is a real identity or actually a fake. And we're going to present the results in a few moments. So please give your vote right now. And then also Pri will actually give some insights about what's actually behind this identity. We already got a good number of sponsors. Let's wait for five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. And I'm closing the poll right now. And actually the result is that 86% of the audience believes this is a fake and only 14% believe this is real identity. Free, please let us know and give us some background about what it is. Yeah. So the first risk factor here is the voice over IP phone number. If you're a real person, you're more likely to use your actual cell phone number that you probably have. Um, 
again, another risk factor was the fact that they stated that they owned a residency, but nothing actually shows up on their credit report. Most of their trade lines, if you take a look at them, are authorized users. So they're not actually the people who opened up the account. They just got added on thereafter, which is often a sign of a fabricated identity attempting to appear more legitimate and creating a fake credit score for themselves. Another red flag is the use of a PO box because they're not going to send anything to a actual address that they own. A fake person can send as many identity or fake identity setting up at a PO box as they want to. The random numbers at the end of their email is not a typical trend that you'll see among true identities. If you look at your own email address, typically you have one to two digits but you don't normally have that many digits towards the end of your, their income is not substantiated by their credit files. Another strange one, a random social security number could be strange considering the age that they're at. Those were issued or social security numbers during that time were typically issued by your location and your age. And then you could see another in orange, the piggybacking off of someone else's credit file to build a fake one. And then inflated credit file due to authorized user accounts. Anything else you see there, Mike, that you want to point out? Holly said born in 77, which I, they should, they may have. If you're born in 77, you should probably have a thicker file. I would agree there. But yeah, that's good. 86% got it right. I got it wrong on purpose just to make sure that somebody got it wrong, depending on how many people are in the sample. Yeah, it could have been better. That's good. So we'll go to the next one. Okay. And also show us some experts in the room. So pre- Please give us some insights to the second profile. Where you want to do this one, you may cover it. I can cover it if you'd like. Yes, please. Okay. My eyes aren't as good as yours. <laughs> I'm actually using my other screen. You're fine, Mike. So the name that we have on file is Sarah C. Smith. And the information that we're going to give out for free is that the name and the address is a mismatch. So we haven't seen that name with that address before. The name and the phone number is also a mismatch. They do have a higher credit score at 720. They're stating that they've been at that address for less than one year. The email that they're using is sarah.carter. And the name that we have provided again is Sarah C. Smith. The income does match the credit file, but we are getting information that the name and social security number are mismatched. The time that they have on file is 10 years. They're born in the 90s. And they have these two trade lines, both individual liability accounts for 10 grand each. And do you think it's relevant that the person is a data scientist or not important? I guess not important. <laughs> Just okay. free bits of information. Okay. Clues, if you will. So then let's kick off the, the poll. And let's see if the audience gets it also right this time. So please take the chance again to look at this identity and tell us real or fake. So it looks like this time is a bit more Difficult. Too much fraud from Georgia and Florida and Houston. Okay, let's do a countdown again. Five, four, three, two, one. I'm closing the poll right now. So actually real is 49% and fake is 51%. But it's really, but I guess that's also the difficult part for, let's say for a bank or for any financial institution looking at this to really flagging certain cases in the right way. We have all the experts in the room right now, but we don't have one single opinion. So it's like on the edge. Mike Bree, please provide us some insights. How would you look at this? Yeah, so this one, we were trying to trick you up just a little bit to make it fun. But the things to note for this is that people can appear to look fabricated or manipulated. 
right? But there's just some new information in their life that will throw off some of your indicators. So for instance, in this case, uh, Sarah C. Smith, our fake real identity here, it's because they recently got married and they changed their last name. So the hint to that is that the email name is Sarah Carter and the name that's on the application is Sarah C. Smith to indicate that Carter was a previous last name or a now hyphenated last name. Um, and then now they're renting, which it's not unusual to be at an address for a short amount of time when you're renting, but there, we're also indicating here that they've been married for less than a year. They just moved into the husband's residence and things like that. Um, we do have 10 years on file for this identity, which can sometimes be hard to fake, especially when we're looking at the trade lines for this person, that these are individual liability type credit. They're unlike the last fabricated identity one where we looked at where they were authorized users for almost all the trade lines that they had available. And the reason that the name that social security number did not tie is because the new name that they have has not yet been reflected in it yet. So it's one of those, every identity deserves a little bit of context before we assign labels to them. Yeah. And just, you know, I would add, Ronald, if a key thing to have is a definition for synthetic fraud and that all the fraud investigators have the same definition and that they're working off the same sheet, right? Because then you can have a very consistent way of identifying like what is synthetic and what's not. And the definitions should be pretty robust. I think our definition for synthetic is a two page document that not only identifies what should not be synthetic and what should be synthetic, but also if you are building a model, you want to identify your false positives, right? So if you've identified somebody as synthetic in your model, or let's say even if your vendor has, you want to be able to capture why did the model see that as synthetic, right? Was it a DOB that was fat fingered? Was it because there was an I-10 and a social? Was it because there was a social that was used in the past for the identity that was synthetic, but now it looks like they've gone straight and they're trying to use their real identity. Having a really good definition is a solid thing. We have a great one. If somebody doesn't have one, we're happy to send you ours. It's not something we consider proprietary. We think standard definitions are something the industry should have. Thank you for providing this background. We have roughly 10 minutes left in our session today. And I think that's really the time to go through all the questions. We have still some questions left in the chat. But again, to the audience, please take this opportunity in asking your questions. Take the chance on the right hand side and type in your questions. And we're trying to provide the right information or the right background here. But there was one question I think is interesting. How should consumers protect their accounts if the bank are not detecting the fabricated synthetic ID? Of course, this is a big question, but we have the experts in the room right now to maybe give some advice to consumers out there. So let me try and answer that one. So that was a good question. I wrote that down too. So Ron, I'm glad you picked that one. So I think that there's two answers here. One is your identity in a fabricated identity, your specific identity should not be impacted. However, if somebody is creating an identity and it's fabricated and they happen to use your social security number, that might create problems in your credit report. So if you ever look at your credit report, you that there's some trade lines that are attached to it or a name that's associated with it that's not yours, you need to talk to the bureaus and you need to get that off. So that's one way that it will impact you. Another way that it will impact you is if you are doing P2P. So let's just take a, a real example of, hey, you're on Craigslist. You see these great dogs. They're in your area, roughly. I can't believe a Bernice Mountain Doodle would go for $2,000. They're generally for whatever. So you send the $2,000 and you never get the, you never get the dog back. You, get, you send the money, you never get the tickets back, right? That's going to impact you. And that's a lot of times they're money mules or they are synthetic, which are the new money mules. And so that's going to impact you in, in a bad way. So then the other way, and this is something that it's weird, right? I want to get to parents and Bree, you have one kid on the way and you have a young one, right? What I would do to protect not me, but my child is get their social security number, put a security freeze on it because it is the kids today that have random socials where when they turn 18 and they want to get credit, or if they're trying to get it at 16 even, 
they may find they already have a credit report in that social that's there. So if you're a parent, you know, what I would suggest is putting in a security freeze on your newborn as soon as you have that social um, to protect them. So it's a great question about how do you protect yourself? As a consumer, you got to monitor your credit report. You might get attached to something just because it's synthetic fraudster use your social on accident. You will can get impacted by P2P scams, by a synthetic, but that just means you have to be very careful with what you click on and who you send money to. And the third is if you're a parent, you should try and freeze your kids social as soon as you get it. I think that's a good advice, Mike. I'm not sure how many people out there actually know about this to really how to protect this kind of, let's say early stage of the security number. I think that's a good one to actually communicate this much more to, to really, yeah, to make it known to many people. I think there's one more interesting question, at least, which I pick. And also please, Bri and Mike pick from your side as well. There's one question from Brenda. What is in your opinion about fake profiles on social media being synthetic identities? Is there any kind of relationship between synthetic identities and fake profiles? Is there any kind of trend between, I don't know, Instagram, Facebook, or any other social medias? Do you have any insights here which is relevant to this topic? Bri, I think I asked you this question like two weeks ago, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you did. So for fabricated synthetic identities, we typically don't actually see that many social media accounts that tie to their emails or phone numbers. And at that point, I honestly think that it's just about the time that it creates or the time it takes to create social media platforms and make them look decent, the lemon isn't worth the squeeze, right, for them, because they're creating multiple fabricated identities. It's not just about one that they're picking, and then they're trying to run with that one identity multiple times. So typically, we don't see a lot of social medias for fake identities. However, we do see a lot of social media for manipulated identities, because those manipulated identities are typically using their real email and phone number because they want all that data to come back to them. So in those cases, we'll see social media, not normally for fabricated though. It wouldn't surprise me if some of them have created fake ones to get past certain restrictions, but it's not something we see often. I have seen a few and it's interesting if you have a small business portfolio, the good fabricated small business identities, they will establish even a website, right? And so I took one website that looked really suspicious and I copied the language on it, pasted it in Google, a, a crazy amount of the language, pasted it in Google. And I found it was a, it was a commercial shipping website. And I found that they had basically stolen somebody else's legit website and used it as their own. And that was pretty, uh, it was pretty interesting. It was from a, a little town in California that we all know where a lot of synthetics happen. So... I think we have questions. We have maybe time for maybe one or two more questions. Bri, do you see any questions or Mike, which you would like to pick? Otherwise, I saw one. It was from Kevin, and he said his question was underground bank. Let's see if I can read my handwriting. Underground banking systems (IBTS) work around for CIPs. Presumes it may presume there's a market that will always be able to sidestep detection, right? So basically, is there workarounds for CIPs? And the answer is yeah. And CIP, there is absolutely workarounds for synthetic. And so CIP is not a solution for synthetic fraud. I think, Kevin, I think that's the answer. If I got your question wrong, I'm sorry, just email me and I'll try and respond differently. But CIP solutions can be defeated for synthetic. And they definitely, if you have CIP solutions, you feel like they're covering you for synthetic, they're not. And so you have to be real careful of that. Yeah, time is running fast. We already close to the hour. And again, for everybody, you can see on this slide, contact information from Secure. So if you have more questions, please contact the right experts to get more information. You can scan the QR code and also we provided the handout here in the session. So you can also download the document directly up to you, different channels. Again, to the audience, thank you for being here today. Thank you for being active in, in all your questions. Bri, thanks a lot for being so insightful with the real first line insights. I think it's always good to really get this kind of different perspective on the same topic. 
Mike, thanks a lot for sharing all your expertise and again, for being supportive of About Fraud. Yeah, again, great webinar, great topic, great speakers. Thanks for all the questions. Thank you, Ron. Appreciate it. Thanks About Fraud. We appreciate the audience. Thank you very much.